Welcome to Tomorrow Never Knows with me, Bob Wilson, and Tawaran Brown of the Beatles Kingdom. Our special guests tonight are Dr. Kid O'Toole and Mean Mr. Mayo. And we'll talk more talk on whittling the White Album down to one disc from two. And also Beatles compilation albums. Lend us your ears and we'll give you a show. We're sneaking into the Talk More Talk series and we're getting into their feed. And we've stolen it and we've gotten into their studio. Welcome. Hello. 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 Yeah, where are these voices coming from, Joe? Yeah. I, I don't I'm know. I'm starting to hear I've been doing talk more talk too long. I'm starting to hear strange voices. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, guys. <laughs> well, before we get to it, we have to thank our sponsor, Beatles Magazine. Beatles Magazine is a publication with 370 plus million visitors in all their pages, read by thousands of fans around the world every day. Beatles News is updated daily, 24 hours, audio, video, photos, interviews, contests, additional materials, and more. Follow the Beatles Magazine, the most complete online coverage, 24 hours a day and eight days a eight week. Eight days a week. Eight days, days a week. A week. Days a week. I love, uh, 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 of it. So I have a question for both Dr. Kit and Mean Mr. Mayo. George Martin has historically, it's a very big quote, he said, the White Album would have been a better single disc than it was when released as a double album. So naturally, all those Beatles fans started to argue about this. So if we whittle it down to 12 or 14 songs, could you guys tell us which songs you would pick and we'll go through them? Let's start with Dr. O'Toole, our favorite guest who's been on just about as much as anybody. And she always brings us to a higher level. It's not hard to do on our show, but she does a great job of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's quite an introduction, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> that's great. All true. We are loved. We love to have you. Oh well, I always love being on with you guys. Absolutely. And uh, but before I I start, I want to just uh, have Joe say something here. As we talked about this uh, the other night, Joe, say what what uh, you said. You know, you remind me of what oh. Paul McCartney said on anthology about. Yes. You know, Yes. Well, you know, I don't agree with George Martin at all or, or anybody else that, you know, I think even uh, somebody else might. I think they're an anthology, maybe George or Ringo. Somebody said, yeah, we should have done one album. Yeah. Uh, but Paul, I don't always agree with everything Paul says, but over the course of history, Beatles history, Paul has occasionally said things that I really give him the thumbs up for. And one of my favorite quote of his, and I'm paraphrasing and I'm doing you know, as much as I can remember, he said something like, well, I, I think that one of the interesting things is that it's got so much different stuff on it. And then he says, you know, I'm not, you know, uh, one for that. Maybe it was one too many of them. He says, you know, it was great. It's old. It's a bloody Beatles White Album. Shut up. <laughs> and uh, I happen to, like, you know, he's saying it in jest, you know, but I kind of like uh, agree with him. But but it's still a lot of fun to do this. And uh, people, you know, for fun. You know, to see what we could do, and it's not. No, it was not easy. This for money. This is actually a money contest. Oh no. well, okay. Yeah, well, we well, you our money. We just give you our jests and jubilation. Sorry. There you well, go. I should have got a lot of money because it was not easy. I thought it was going to be a yeah. lot easier than it was. It really was. Yeah. I mean, I, I had to, you know, sort of come up with, you know, sort of criteria to, to, to uh, you know, figure out which ones to pick. And so, you know, balancing them out for, for each one. And, and so, uh, yeah, it, it was pretty hard. But here Would we go. Give them like your picks first and then his separate all at once. Or do you want to do them one at a time? Would you like to go through all of your picks first and then we'll compare to, I uh, mean, Mr. Mayo? What, whatever you Parker. guys want. Well, what are you um, comfortable with? I feel like the chipmunks that are very polite on the Bugs Bunny stage. <laughs> no, 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 I insist. You go first. Oh, no, well, no, first no, of all. Our white album, and then me and Mr. Mayo will tell us his white album. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then we'll Why compare we do... the differences. Okay, and, that sure. sounds good. I like oh. to say, I like to say, first of all, we already did our picks on the white album and how we would split it up. And this is why we're asking you to. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Actually, oh. I brought it up to Kit and invited her first, and I couldn't wait, and then we had to talk but, about it because... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, let's go. Here's side one. Um, I stuck with Back in the USSR and Dear Prudence. 
I really, I, I couldn't really feel, I, I couldn't think of a way to improve on that. I mean, I love the kicking it off with a rocker like that. Um, and then the way the, uh, the plain sound goes right into Dear Prudence. Um, I just, I love that, that sort of one-two punch that the uh, that side one begins with. So I ended up, I decided to keep that. I, I just, uh, I love both songs. They're classics, uh, classic uh, Paul and John there. Um, next, I uh, chose Blackbird. Um, because how can you possibly have the White Album without Blackbird? Another, uh, another classic. So we have another um, uh, McCartney. Um, next, I picked Happiness is a Warm Gun. I think this is a masterpiece of John's. Um, you know, I love that it's in the, you know, kind of the f almost four movements. It's such a, a complicated track. I can't imagine the, the White Album without it. It's almost a kind of encompasses what the White Album is about. It's it's kind of, you know, it's a little, it's complicated, it's messy, it's it's just, uh, um, you know, perfect, uh, perfect summary of it. Uh, Savoy Truffle would be my, my next pick for a George song. I've always loved the horns on this. Um, I uh, just uh, think it's a, you know, I love the distortion on it. I, I've just always uh, been a big fan of this, uh, this song. One of, uh, one of George's best, certainly on, on the White Album. Um, and then uh, Revolution One, um, you know, I did not pick Revolution 9, but I'm sure we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Revolution 1, I think it's, you know, I, of course, I love the single version, uh, but I think it's important to have this version. I mean, to have both of them out there. So, uh, you know, the first one, uh, very, uh, very important to have. Mother Nature's Son be my, my next choice. I think, you know, it re represents their time in India. And finally, I'm So Tired. Um, which uh, I it's always been one of uh, my favorite of John's for his vocals on it. I get so, eight out of that. And right. so, well, mm -hmm. well, actually, I'm 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 kind of torn on that one. So yeah. maybe I'll kick that to the uh, you know sort of a maybe track. So that's right because yeah, I did some. See, this was hard. I did some switching around. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yep, yep exactly. So, hard. all right, we'll we'll leave that one because that one I was I was like, leave it in, take it out, leave it in, take <laughs> it out. All right, that'll be a maybe. So, but side two, this is definite. Uh, while my guitar gently weeps, um, I mean, how can you possibly cut that out? And I think that'd be a a great way to kick off a side um, of yeah. of the record. Yeah, right. I mean. Yeah. I mean, how can you, you know, um, then bring it down a bit, kind of like on side one uh, with Julia, one of uh, John's, I think, best compositions. Um, birthday, not because it's, you know, it's it's not deep or anything, but it's just a great rocker. And it's one that John and Paul worked on together. Um, and uh, and it's just a lot of fun. I mean, you listen to it in concert today and it still sounds great. Um, Got to give Ringo one. Don't don't pass right. me by is my choice. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's a great it, it's got kind of an off kilter charm to it. And and that country uh, country sound uh, your blues, which has always been just a personal favorite of mine, of, of John's. It's uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just a great. I mean, it's a it's a blues number, um, and uh, then Helter Skelter, which is a track that, quite frankly, took a long time to grow on me. I when I oh, when yeah. I yeah when I first got this album, you know, when I was like you know in high school or something, I just did not get this song at all. I was mm -hmm. like, you know, I just like what is this? But over the years, now I really like it. I mean, now I get it for the masterpiece. That it, that it a is. lot of people I've heard don't care for it, believe it or not. I don't. To me, it's it's a shock. But some Beatle fans don't really care for it much. I've yeah, heard I think, over the years. Yeah, I think part of it is it just sounds so different. You know, I mean, it just sounds so different, and so hard, and and confrontational. I don't know. I don't yeah. know what it is, but you it was just some something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I've learned as I've gotten older. Yeah, confrontation yeah, was good. Yeah. And so, and now I remember why I had I'm so tired because I was going to move that to side two because I decided um, to end the, the side two with Helter Skelter, but have 
kind of like on Abbey Road, have a hidden track. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> like like Her Majesty, but this time I will. So I had to have uh, that as oh, like, I forgot like about I will. the Oops. fake out track. <laughs> oh, I forgot about I will. So I knew I hadn't gone completely crazy. So that was that was my that's right, that was my my thought. That's why I left it. I'm so tired. So so that was my my those are my choices. I tried to balance everybody, um, yeah. you know, picking out the best ones and thinking about, you know, how the best to kick off the album and how to close it out. So good, those good. are Nice. Those are my picks. Yeah. Okay. Well, that nice. was excellent choices. I think that's a great album. Mm -hmm. I could listen to it straight through. I can't listen to the regular White album straight through. You know, obviously Revolution. Oh. And I only need to hear so many times. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we whittled it down to to a low fifteen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many tracks like were actually on the album? Does anybody have a list in front of them? With I the want to say thirty one. I was, was going to say. I was going to say thirty. Yeah, something like I, that. I think it was 30. That would have been a good name for the album, 30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, yeah I was. It's funny because, I mean, you know, when I did this, a lot of times when I do things like this, I'll have the list out somewhere. Right. And I'll just go down the track. This time I did it from memory, and I mm. forgot I will. Why do you like that? <laughs> I, I forgot it existed, which I don't know how. But, uh, <laughs> all right, when I did my list, though. Let me know when you're ready. <laughs> and are you going to delineate like Kit did from side one to side two? Yes. Side okay, one so we have side like the vinyl choices. I like it. I'm into it. Oh, yes, the vinyl <laughs> choices. Sure. Of course. Well, I'll tell you, you know, Kit knows that a lot of times we are in sync with a lot of things. We seem to see things similarly a lot of the time. So I'm going to start off by saying I was thinking a lot like Kit. I, you know, it, a lot of it has to do with what you're used to for decades. You know, yeah. I can't imagine the album not starting with "Back in the USSR" and with the plane and all that. I'm like, I just could not get that out of my head. So I said, "Well, I'm going to do that." So I picked "Back in the USSR" to open the album, although it's not a personal favorite anymore of mine. You know, that's interesting. Um, some I tried to do what I thought belonged on the album more than what if it's a personal favorite, although. Most of these uh, I like quite a bit, <laughs> if not all. But uh, that's the only. Well, I'm looking at my list. That's the only one that uh, <laughs> that I was like maybe not. But then once I started doing back in the USSR, went into Dear Prudence. Right. And, okay, so I put Dear Prudence. I love that song. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the best songs on the album. Maybe my favorite. Not sure, but it's one of them. All right, so Dear Prudence was number two. And then, now, I'll, I'll, I'll break it up a little bit here, but now I went with right. Obla de Obla Da. Yeah, I, there you go. I will eventually make it interesting. <laughs> That's the third track again. And I'm like, well, I'm doing the album as it was presented. But those three, I think, fit so nicely. I can't imagine them not. And, and these days, you know, again, I guess even Obla de Obla Da, I'm kind of like a little bit burnt out on, on that. But I think it's like such a fun song that if I hadn't been overdosed on it, I think I'd want it on here. So mm. it has to be on here, I thought. So that was the third track. Now, where I, now I'm trying to like put some John in there, trying to put some softer with some heavier contrast a little bit. So I went to Year of Blues, a track which I like also. Like Kit said, she, she, she enjoys Year of Blues. I, I really love that song uh, by John. And that, that's the first major change I put. It went to Year of Blues after Ovala, the Ovala Da. So you, when you get the... Granny Paul stuff. <laughs> then you get, bam, John comes in and knocks you over the head with your blues. <laughs> then I said, now we got to so let's go soft again. So I put Mother Nature's Son in there. Had I remembered I will, and I was only going to pick one, I might have picked I will over Mother Nature's Son, but it's oh, this, call. This is so good, though, you know? So I went yeah. for Mother Nature's Son for five. Now, the last two on side one, again, it's kind of lazy, but again, I, I just love it in this sequence. I went with George for While My Guitar Gently Weeps, just as it is on the regular album, closing the side with Happiness is a Warm Gun. With that, <laughs> I just can't imagine it any other way. So I did it, uh, two changes in that side, right. uh, the two songs. Then we flipped the old album over. Again, I'm not very, I'm looking at this, I'm like, gee, I'm not very original. You know, Kit, at first, I w for a while, I had While My Guitar Gently Weeps leading off side two, like you said. Yeah. I felt the same way. Well, that's a different way of opening it. But I just copped out with Martha, my dear. Just like mm -hmm. opens up 
So I do. Oh. So with that piano intro, mm -hmm. you know, awesome mm -hmm. idea. And what do you know? I went into I'm so tired. Isn't that the again? <laughs> I, a lot of it was the same way. I'm so tired. And then I went into Blackbird after I'm so tired again. But uh, now it's time for George to make an appearance again. Uh, Savoy Truffle. So we go from Awesome Idea to I'm So Tired to Blackbird and Savoy Truffle, which I love. Yeah. All reasons you said, the distortion, the saxophones, the uh, the subject even. You know, I even like the subject about him you know, kind of like, you know, lecturing uh, Eric Clapton about his sweet tooth, which is <laughs> and, and what can happen is the teeth are all going to rot out. You know, I love that song. Uh, and uh, Savoy Truffle ends, da 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 and then I went to Sexy Sadie. Uh, I like that song. I couldn't not do it. Uh, so that's rare. And, uh, <laughs> and Sexy Sexy Sadie. Uh, also, I think on the regular album leads into Helter Skelter. So that's where I put my Helter Skelter right after that. There you go. Helter Skelter to close the album. I went with Good Night yeah. from Ringo because uh, I think it's a really nice, beautiful song. I think Ringo does a good job on it. I like Don't Pass Me By also, but we figure, mm -hmm. you know, that's usually what we do. We have one Ringo song maybe, maybe two George songs. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's what I have, what I did But my album. And a couple of comments on yours, uh, Kit, if I may. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. I'm looking at the, the track. Look, I love all the songs. Birthday, Julia, all those ones you picked are fantastic. Yeah. But Revolution 1, I kept off. Um, and the only reason is for me personally, I love the single version. Yeah. Yep. So I like it harder like that. And I never was a fan of the Shooby Doo Wops uh, uh, in that song. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I, you know, I kind of always loved the, the single one, B yeah, side of Gay Droop. I do so. too. And, and it was it was a hard call. I kind of put it on more for like historic reasons uh, more than like it's not a. It, it, I mean, I agree. I think the single version's a lot punchier and, and uh, you know, but for this, I mean, the whole thing about when he sings, you know, count me out in, uh, uh, you know, sort of representative of the time that yeah. it was recorded in, you know, so it was more. I, I, it was a tough call, but I was thinking, well, for historic, you know, kind of putting the album in context i'll i'll put that one in but but i agree with you that i i actually the, you know for songs i go back and listen to it's the single version more yeah, yeah. but it's funny and i didn't change it you know as you can tell i didn't change it up as much as i might have just it's so you know embedded in my mind the way it is <laughs> i just made a few changes but uh those are the ones that i, that I included it's hard to change a good album in the first oh, yeah. place. Sure yeah. <laughs> but and, um, and Revolution 9, I want to touch on something that I believe Bob said, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even though, I mean, I'm not a, you know, I could do without Revolution 9. Uh, but wh whenever I do play the album, which is not that often lately, I do play the whole thing if I can, you know. Uh, and then I don't mind having it. Does, does that make sense? Because it's so different. Everything, they have a little bit of everything, a little country sound, a little old timey with honey pie you know uh rock metal, everything and then you even have uh stuff like revolution nine which is complete and utter chaos and experimentation mm -hmm. so i don't mind it listen to it in context of the whole album but i would never go over to the old cd player or the you know uh, whether it's downloading cd or vinyl i i'm not going to go and say well, i think i feel like hearing revolution number nine yeah. Right. You weren't cranking it on the way home. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not not cranking it in the car. No. Right. What is it? Mention we didn't right. mention Rocky Raccoon. What do you yeah. guys? I'm sorry. Uh -oh. Um, you know, I I think I mean Rocky Raccoon is it's of course interesting uh in that i mean it's it's a fun song and it's interesting the donovan connection that paul and donovan wrote that together and and even you know the guitar work in it is is influenced by by donovan it was a tough call uh, i love i love the song one. you know i like i like it more these days than i did as a, as a teenager so yeah. i like it a lot now a lot mm -hmm. and i had it on here at one point you know i, I scribbled things off and uh <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> I scribbled a whole bunch of things off here and there. I, I changed it around a bunch of times, you know. Uh, in the end, it didn't make the final cut, but but it was close. And I don't know. It's it was it, that's the thing. So hard to choose. 
It yes. could be a B side for like a single from the songs that we left off. What about Long, Long, Long? Oh, beautiful. I love that song. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's funny that in the new, uh, well, last release we had, or Giles Martin working on it and so oh, forth, up, it, yeah. it, it really like came to life even more. It was, you know, brought up more than we're used to. Although I always thought we kind of lost a little of the mystery of the song and uh, it was kind of like mysterious in a way, the way it had always been a little quieter. But yeah, but I can only keep it to two George songs and those were the two that I favored. Yeah, me too. It was a tough call. And, and yeah, definitely I gained a lot more uh, respect for Long, Long, Long after that remastering. I, I thought, uh, and I heard it for the first time at that uh, Monmouth University conference a couple of years ago. Uh, they, the uh, box set was just coming out that same weekend. And so, you know, not many people had heard the, the new mix before and they played that on so these big speakers and I mean you could hear a pin drop in the room I mean I I was just blown away I mean it, it made me listen to the song in a whole new way you know it, it just uh, I thought it benefited that song benefited greatly from from that remixing but uh, it's a great you know it's a beautiful song haunting no I know they needed a single for Apple Records but I wasn't aware until we started looking into this when Kit brought up, you know, we talked about possibly whittling down the album that Hey Jude came out of these sessions. Now, we could, you could also talk about like how Apple needed a single and stuff for that. But if that song was included, how does the album change? Like what I was unsure what George had some songs lingering around for a while that were quite good. Uh, not better than Well, My Guitar Gently Weeps, but maybe equal to it i wasn't sure the time frame if they still had those had they included hey jude and maybe another george song or two how might the album have been different uh, yeah, i think it would have been even better you know um but uh, i also I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of singles you know too i like the idea of hey jude being a single with, with, with Revolution. I mean, um, although, you know, oh, I keep thinking how good the fast version of Revolution would have also sounded on here, though. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, yeah, I think it would have been stronger, strong, too. The same thing as they say uh, with regard to, you know, so, just talk about Sergeant Pepper, about how Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane were the beginning of Sergeant Pepper. And all people like, oh, they, they were going to be on the album, they, then they weren't because they needed a single for Christmas to put out first. It, it should have been on the album. It, it, it would be even stronger, people say. And I'm like, well, I suppose so, but what a great single. Strawberry Feels Forever in Penny Lane. And uh, even without them on there for such a long time, Pepper was considered the greatest rock album of all time. Anyway, you know, masterpiece. So anyway. Yeah. No. Yeah, well Oh, no, I was just going to say, I, and I'm just, just thinking out loud here, that I wonder if Hey Jude had been included on the White Album, if they would have had uh, the full version, you know, the, the full-length version on the album, and then had done an edit for radio, which I think would have been a shame, because, you know, I think the whole... You know, the whole single is... I mean, the whole song in its entirety is... Um, is the key to to that track yeah. and i just wonder if that had happened if they had just you know they would have spliced it down to you know three minutes or whatever right. it was and uh and i think J, J jude would have you know possibly suffered for that interesting yeah. question but how, i don't remember off the top of my head and you guys are so good with the little you know not little things but you know knowing all these things down to a t how long was Revolution 9? Like, if you put Re Hey Jude and how much? I was going to say, I think it's longer than, because I, I, I think Hey Jude is, I want to say, 749, yeah. something like that, seven minutes and change, or so, you know. Yeah. I think Revolution 9 is longer than that. I think you're right. Yeah. And I think it's because it took up the whole side of the album, right? There wasn't even a little squeaker in there after it. Uh, we're talking about Revolution Well, I mean, 9. Revolution 9, if you knocked it off the album. Oh, yeah, yeah. You put Hey Jude in it. I don't know if George had All Things Must Pass rolling around. You could have changed the song order. It, it could have been a very different record. And don't forget about Not Guilty also. Well, they never could get a good a version they were satisfied with of Not Guilty, really. I don't think 102 that. takes wasn't enough? Yeah. <laughs> I guess he, not. <laughs> George tried to get it on there. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. sure did. Yeah. 
And then there was that other song, uh, Circles, which I don't like at all, to be frank. You know, yeah. Circles. Not a, yeah, right. not a great, not one of the best, that's for sure. Now, Warren's I, warming up in the bullpen with some questions, but I wanted to ask. George Martin got like a rap like he left during the sessions and, and such and such, and it was almost like they said, oh, he just went on vacation. But at the same time, Jeff Emmerich completely quit. And there was interesting stuff in his book here, there, and everywhere where he was basically saying when they came back from um, being with the Maharishi, they were like different people and they changed and they were kind of like more. When George said he saw Elvis, he's like, I was like a dirty little hippie and there was Elvis. But jo Jeff was, you know, I'm kidding around, but Jeff said they just came back kind of dirty, stoned, not happy, fighting. And then Ringo quit for a time too. So I was wondering if there might have been a little more to George Harris. You know, I think George Martin, I mean, seems like a classy guy and he's not going to spill too many beans too often. But might there have been another reason why he flew to Spain? I don't know. Uh, I don't, George Martin, as you say, uh, classy guy doesn't spill the beans, didn't even want to tell us the story about uh, apparently having a little bit of an affair, as we found out later uh, in the beginning years uh as to why uh they wound up making him sign the beatles which is a whole other story that came out in mark lewison's research and book but anyway uh i don't know of another way i'm trying to like save face by having something to say i really don't know how about you kid? Well, you have an instinct well, like it doesn't have to be um no instinct yeah. you know like you you follow this stuff and when i hear it all i know is is what i glean from all the things i've heard and you know you pick up over we've been into this you know, enjoying the Beatles for so many years. I just don't picture George Martin, this professional guy, gentleman, even if he was annoyed, just saying, hey, I'm going to Spain, you know, good luck with that White Album. It just seems like something happened there. Well, I think it, it really, you know, was a combination of factors. I mean, I I've, I think I've, maybe on, on your show before, I've, I've said this, that it's, you know, it was kind of the perfect storm of things that happened. You know, of course, uh, you know, Brian Epstein was gone. Um, they uh, had gone to, uh, you know, study with the Maharishi and I think felt kind of, you know, in some ways they were very creatively inspired um, from that, from their trip uh, to India, but they were also kind of rudderless, right? I mean, they had Brian, you know, they didn't have Brian anymore to, to guide them. I mean, the Magical Mystery Tour was was <laughs> was exhibit one of, of that. Uh, then, of course, they had the business troubles. Um, you know, they were fighting over that and, you know, establishing Apple. And interestingly enough, um, you know, Ken Womack, our, our mutual buddy, we uh, he wrote a, a excellent two volume uh, biography on George Martin. And one of the things he talked about was that one of the reasons that there was this friction going on with uh, George and the Beatles during the White Album was that apparently there had been, you know, after Sgt. Pepper came out and, and there was all the, you know, press about it, that you know, George Martin was given a lot of credit as saying, well, he was kind of the the conductor of the of the album, that he had a lot to do with the success of the album. And he was the, you know, the mastermind behind it. And uh, apparently the Beatles let him know that uh, they really didn't appreciate uh, that that article it was in Time magazine. Um, and uh, so that contributed to the tensions that were already there and they wanted him to know. I that... interject a tough question. Mm -hmm. Did he have a point? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, you, I, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I've often said that I, I absolutely think George Martin was the fifth Beatle. I Me mean, too. I, I yeah, agree. I, no question. I mean, I know other people say Brian Epstein, he was extremely important to their success, no question, but In I'm the sorry. Studio. Jo it was George, uh, George Martin. George Martin, you bet. Um, and, you know, and he definitely had this uncanny ability of being able to translate ideas like George or uh, uh, John saying to him about being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, I want to be able to smell the, the sawdust. Yeah, and, right. and George, yeah, and George Martin was able to, oh, okay, maybe let's try this. And you know, so he, he was just a genius at that. Um, you know, would Sergeant Pepper sounded like it with under, you know, with a different producer? I don't know. But, uh, but 
you know, the Beatles did write the songs, um, for sure, uh, and had the concept and everything. But uh, but that's that's one of the things that, that came out of Ken's book. I just found that fascinating that there was, in addition to all these other things going on, there was this little tension of the, you know, the Beatles now saying, you're not the teacher anymore, yeah, you know. <laughs> funny how it starts with a little... A, a few guys naive you go, just going into the studio, and then it changes to that over the over the time. The tables almost turn a little bit exactly, like exactly, you know, exactly. Kind of interesting. Yeah. I agree, like with what you're saying. It's just I give George Martin like it's just when egos come into play. It's kind of like when I've heard the Beatles solo, like and I you know I love the Beatles, but it's like sometimes on you know on shows you take a chance saying anything that could send set the throngs against you like Frankenstein's castle is being stormed. <laughs> it, that was sometimes me. I think to George, it's like they said, and I love Bob Dylan, but it's like they said to the two of them, like they were like the two men on planet earth who were prodigiously talented, who needed a producer really badly. And like when Jeff Lynn wasn't with George or, you know, when he worked with the Beatles and George Martin had the reins, I think he was better. And even Paul, when his solo albums came out, like to me, Flaming Pie is the closest thing other than the Ringo album from 73. Those are the two that sound the closest to me, like a Beatle album. Um, but I think That's George Martin, he, he just had, like, I love Flaming Pie. It was coming off anthology, right? Yeah. And, and Paul was like in a Beatles set of mind. It sounds like a Beatles album to me. And tug, don't forget Tug of War at the time. When Tug of War came out, George Martin uh, produced that. That really sounded really good you know at the time but the, if i could just say if, if i may a little bit there, absolutely bob about um doesn't ha to me in my opinion it doesn't have to sound like a beatles album the solo albums um but they do the ones you mentioned you got a good point there yeah closest to a beatles album but uh, you know i'm okay with them sounding like something else once they split up you know um myself but to me was it as good to you like i mean what can be yeah. as good as the beatles nothing it's like saying Wow. I don't know what to even compare it to, but it's, I, it's just when they were solo, it, it was almost like they even Paul said I wanted to sound different with wings than I did with the Beatles. So I was conscious like you, what is it like to sit down and write a song and consciously not like I can't grasp it because at that level, it's it's one thing he's writing at such a high level, um, but to sit down and write a song consciously not like what you used to do and yet you're still having hits you guys want to comment yeah. on that and then i'll hand over to our buddy warren brown to pick me up in the sixth inning well, well one thing i would like to, to say uh, how to put this out the right way uh, is like well you mentioned flaming pie it's a very good album you know and i mentioned tug of war another good paul album i think Great album. so those those two are like kind of uh, what you're saying really if i'm going to use those examples but you know, it always gets me that I lo look. I love the Beatles, and they have that old saying. It's cliche about the uh, what is it? The whole better than the sum of its parts, or something yeah. like uh, or the other way around. But um, I, if we were going to dissect actual solo, I don't want this to be solo versus Beatles because you're looking at two people that do the talk more talk solo show. And I love the solo Beatles. And I don't care. Well, Ken Michaels. Not bring it here. We've we've tuned in on you in your studio. We have taken technology <laughs> to the show. That's so do true. your thing, do your thing. But but, but my, my point at being that there were certain, as much as I love the Beatles, and they can do almost no wrong as, as far as I'm concerned. Indiv some individual songs, uh, you know, uh, you know what, you know what, you know what, the villagers storming the castle, as you say. But like, if I just take <laughs> ones that are maybe arguably lesser great, <laughs> and there I said, like, say something like what you're doing, which I love. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You know, for what it is. It's not as good as Calico Skies. Uh, good point. It's not as good as Every Night. I'm trying to think of like just songs that pop into my head. Jet. I don't. Uh, well, Jet doesn't really mean anything, but I love it as a rock. <laughs> so yeah, rocker, I, I'm yeah. saying, you know, there's always that little argument that I always go with other Beatles fans, and my friend Anthony is a good example of that. He thinks everything's better as, as the Beatles, but he's starting to discover stuff that he hears on Sirius XM solo stuff, and he's like, "Wow, that's a good song." You know, that's a good, good song. I think My Love is, some people don't like it. My Love by Paul, I think, is as good a ballad as anything he did with the Beatles. But opinions vary on that. So I I, I, I really think something like Wanderlust, I think, is a classic. Could have been on the White Album or something. Or, 
some yeah. days from Paul. Uh, but wasn't it like, it seemed to me that, does it seem this way to you? Anthology seemed to bring those memories back in him. And he said when they made the tracks with John's voice, I made believe John was on vacation and I was finishing the song. That Those other songs, it seems like maybe, you know, I'm reading into it, but that's our job, right? It's... um. He, it was almost like he just came off Anthology, and it was like a Beatles album. I think Ringo was on there, too, right? He was playing on Flaming Pie. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can definitely hear, and I mean, even songs like songs we were singing, and, and uh, I mean, you can tell he he definitely was thinking, uh, you know, the, all those interviews he did for Anthology were fresh in his mind, and, and the song Flaming Pie, uh, of course. John, uh, that's John's thing, right? That was his story. Right, that was a story. So, I mean, you know, definitely it was fresh in his mind, but I'll tell you, though, it's, you know, it's, it's we've been talking, it, it, just think about how hard that must have been for, you know, after they broke up to then think, all right, now I've got to start part two of my career and I don't want to repeat myself exactly. I don't want to alienate my, my fans from, you know, my band, my old band, but I don't want to repeat myself. I need to, it, as you said, Bob, like, you know, write in a new way to start. I mean, that is hard. I, I can't imagine. And he did it because Wings doesn't really sound to me. I mean, McCartney's there, no doubt, a given. Right. But I mean, yep. if you put them on, if you erased my memory, something, some people think we've already done that. But it's like if you erased my memory and and you played the songs for me, you could tell the, you like you certainly could. But I mean, I think if I just listened to them, I could say, that's the Beatles, that's Wings. Right. That's the Beatles, that's Wings. Do you guys yeah. agree? To an extent, sure. A large extent, I would agree. Um, but then a lot, a lot of people also think this leads me to thinking when some of the discussions that have been had, uh, well, as good as some of the solo Beatles songs are, like say, I'll just name some early ones like Instant Karma or It Don't Come Easy by Ringo or right, Photograph. No, right? but I'm was, sorry? I don't mean to interrupt you, but it's I, I hate interrupting, but I, it was such a good point. Um, when you said, like, it don't come easy, two Beatles were on that one, right? It's like, yeah, whatever. Maybe I shouldn't have used that example. I had to make <laughs> my point. <laughs> yes. But I mean, you know, people say, well, it would be so much better as a Beatles song. You know, I, I don't know if, if some people say that when, you know, you discuss it. And I don't know about that. Like, All Things Must Pass is as great as it is. It's a great album. A but those album. are standouts. Like, in other words, agreed on that one. What else could you do to it? But it's like those ones are kind of right after the Beatles, and you're picking them out. And he had it when he was with the Beatles, didn't he? Cloud Nine, I think, is fantastic. That's far away from the Beatles. Yes. Um, but ELO, you know, has a lot... Uh, Jack, Jeff Lynn had a lot to do with the production of that. But the songs are there on that album. I don't mean to veer off too much. Different subjects. But, and Ringo yeah. on the drums with the... What did he call it? The steady backbeat. Let me hand off to Warren, because he's patiently oh. been warming up in the bullpen. And <laughs> yeah. now I'm sure... <laughs> So they're signaling for the righty to come in and take me out of the game. Uh, <laughs> you're, right, a tough, you're a tough pitcher. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys you are great hitters. Up. I had to be at the top <laughs> of my game. <laughs> really. Uh, first of all, kid, I wanted to thank you for bringing up the article of George Martin's uh, about the Sgt. Pepper's album. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day about that interview and... Uh, they never seen or heard of it before, so they didn't agree with me, but uh, I was trying to explain that article to them. And uh, second of all, uh, the song Circles that you guys say you don't like, I love that song. Well, I, I, I really do. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes no, the world go round. Yeah, like, exactly. Because in fact, we we've talked about circles on Talk More Talk because uh, we did a an episode um, on Gone Tropo uh, a few weeks ago, and wasn't there? Was it? I, I think it was uh, Ken Michaels. He liked circles. Mm. I, I you think, think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ken liked it. Li yeah, I, I, I do like the lyrics. I like the lyrics in it. Yeah, I think it's the arrangement maybe that we're we're not as uh, you know we don't respond to as much. Right. But that's I mean that's great. That's you know that's right. That's what we love yeah. about doing you know about, about you know doing your show and doing our own show is right. yeah we love to to, to I, meet this I, stuff. 
I put some video to that song that I think really, really goes really well with that um, song. The video does. Oh, uh, you'll, check it you'll out. Yeah, you'll have to check it out. I'll post it on my uh, Facebook for you. You can look at it. Um, I w also wanted to ask you guys, um, with this is for both of you, with the album that you made, with the White Album, if you take the songs that you didn't include on your list and made another album out of it, what would you think about that album? I still Ooh. think it would be pr pretty good, other than <laughs> the ones I rejected. I think that's why I like it to be a double album. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, um, but uh, not, not as strong, I don't think, in my opinion. Um, but I'm looking at the ones... Maybe it'd be strong, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Because, yeah, like I had some runners up. Uh, everybody's got something high except me and my monkey. I, I just, I know it's, you know, maybe it's not the best example of, of uh, you know, masterful songwriting, but that thing rocks. I mean, I just, I will crank that in my car. Um, honey pie, not wild honey pie. The other honey pie. pie. That's mm. fun. Uh, you know, Cry Baby Cry. I've always liked oh, that yeah. one. Oh. You know, Obla Dee Obla Da. That that was a runner up for me. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are. It was it was really hard to uh, to come up with. Uh, you know, Piggies to narrow it down. George. Mm -hmm. Yep. That that has commentary on you know on it, uh, social commentary and. So. so you know, I'm not saying every single track on there is is just you know top top quality, uh, but I think overall though it'd still be a pretty solid album. You know, with, with yeah, so if, if you took number nine off of that second album that you made without the uh, songs that you picked. If you take Revolution Nine off of there and put Hey Jude in there. And what would your second album, will you think of your second album now? Oh, that, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, it's well, a hard question. It's a, and that it's that a song question. alone is, is so, so classic. It's such a great song. That really boosts it up quite a bit, I, I think. Yes. You know, and without question, especially if you take Revolution 9 off, that, that can only help an album, you know, from a commercial right. standpoint. You know, maybe not an experimental standpoint, but a commercial standpoint. That's uh, that's exactly what I was thinking, and I was going to say I hate to sound, you know, cold and calculated, but absolutely from a commercial standpoint, mm -hmm. the White Album would have been even bigger. I mean, I, I think as that was, Hey Jude was such a, you know, a monster hit. But the whole that, thing, if I, that, that, that I got to say, though, when I think, well, I think of it, I don't want to forget it, with, with the White Album, again, going back to what Paul said, you know, it's so different, there's so many different things on it, and even those little things, why don't we do it in the road, Wild Honey Pie, those kind of moments, I look at them as just little snippets of segues, which, which are cool to join the things together, a little break, I, you know, I, I, they, and they didn't do that before, really, before that, and to me, with all the other albums that came before that, you know, you, you had perfectly honed one-disc albums. I think it, it's so cool that in the short span of time that the Beatles had all this material, they did so many different things, including having a wild bubble album that's versatile and all over the place, mm -hmm. to their credit and their catalog. I mean, it's so different, unique in, in that regard. You know, we have plenty of single albums that are perfect, you know, and they don't go all over the place. I think that's what makes the White Album special. You know, right. you know. I agree. And, uh, you know, you were talking about how many songs they wrote in a short period of time. That just amazes me. I couldn't I couldn't write one song in 10 years. <laughs> and, and they were doing hundreds of songs in 10 years. So <laughs> it's just amazing to me. Anyway. Uh, that's why I'm an artist and not a writer. <laughs> anyway, um, were these really more like solo sessions for each Beatle and not a group effort uh, as much as the past? In some cases, I think, right, Kit? Kit would you agree? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, you know, this is, was a big question that came up when that White Album box set 
was released that uh, was because Giles Martin, when he was giving interviews about it, he was saying, oh, these sessions weren't as rancorous as, as they thought, and they actually were in the studio together more than than was, you know, previous thought. And, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe it was a bit of both, but I definitely think, though, it was probably less collaborative than the oh, previous. Sure. Yeah, the I mean, irony, I think that's safe to say. The irony they call is they call it the Beatles. Right. It's a, it's a less Beatles group thing. That the, the title probably stinks when you want to come right down to just the Beatles. Um, in, that, right. in that regard. What that's was it going to be called? True. A Doll's House, maybe, was one of the titles? Yeah, that's what the original title was, uh, A Doll's or, House. Or, or, yeah, or that's some, right. Or some, I like that better, maybe, than, than the Beatles. Yeah. But, right. Uh, you know, so that's the irony. Isn't that crazy? Like, it's the most... Uh, you know, ungroup thing in so yes. many ways. That's a good point. I, I can't imagine that being called the God, the Doll's House. <laughs> <laughs> but yep, that was one of the worst. And, that, and that is where Doll's House has a lot of rooms in it too, a lot of different. Right. <laughs> yeah, so that <laughs> might have been more accurate. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of fits that. In the way. Can I can I ask both of you why did Ringo quit? Oh, I never I, heard that story a million times. That he's uh, I, <laughs> oh, I, do me in the big exact. Yeah, it's basically, you know, it it was a case of that kind of like what we were just saying that uh, they weren't being collaborative, and you know, Ringo really preferred it when um, they were all working together, you know, as as a unit, and. He also felt that, I think he felt he was being underutilized. He said he felt he wasn't, um, you know, playing very well. And um, the story has been told umpteen times that, uh, yeah, you know what's coming, that, um, you know, after (laughs) Ringo... Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) After... After Ringo decided, you know what, I'm t- I'm tired of this, I'm out of here, he went to see John and said, you know, I, I just don't feel like I fit in the group anymore. I feel like, you know, you, uh, Paul and George are, like, close, and I just, I'm the odd one out, and I don't feel, you know, like I belong. And John said, I thought it was you three. And then he went over to Paul and said, uh, uh, Ringo did, went over to Paul's house, Paul, I... I just don't feel I belong in the group anymore, and you know, he's like, I thought it was you three, and you know, so they they told this this story. This has been told many many times, but ultimately, you know, Ringo said he just I think he just didn't feel appreciated, and 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 ultimately, of course. They they did ask him, you know, they they sent him a postcard saying you really are the greatest drummer in the world. And had and his drum decorated, I believe, flowers. flowers. Yep, flowers. yep. 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 When he came drummer. back, and oh, you know, perfect. and let's face it, I think they figured. I mean, okay, theoretically, they probably could have brought in another drummer, but I mean, you know, who else? Ringo just Paul really did had a, a lot of the drums. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah right. But I mean, a yeah, Paul. The yeah, approved, it's, back in the USSR. Yeah, so I right. mean, yeah, Paul could do it, but you know, Ringo just had this uncanny ability to. Kind of like what I was saying about George Martin earlier. You know, he had this uncanny ability to translate what they wanted into yeah. you know these unique fills, and you know they really. Mm-hmm. I mean, to have to then you know quotes break in a new drummer um, right. to uh, to uh, forget it. Uh, it, right. it would have it, so, and plus, of course, they were friends, and and uh, right. so, but but even just looking at it from. You know, a colder standpoint. Um, yeah, I mean that they, they they knew they they needed Ringo back. Um, right. So so, uh, so that was that was basic. I mean, that's the story that that I've always heard that yes. he just felt left out. Right. Yeah, I can't imagine the Beatles with another drummer. Uh, it, it wouldn't be the Beatles, that's for sure. Uh, besides the Flowers, what what made Ringo come back? That's a good question. Why, why, why did he come, actually come back? I don't know. Did he ever say? Uh, he he came back and 
That's all I know. I don't know Let why. Me see. He okay. said he... I'm just looking here. Um, let's see. Okay, I actually have a quote uh, from money. my phone. Yeah, you need money. That's for sure. That, 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 that. This was what he said uh, in Anthology. Uh, he said, I got a telegram saying you're the best rock and roll drummer in the world. Come on home. We love you. Oh. And so I came back. We all needed that little shake-up. When I got back to the studio, George had had it decked with, out with flowers. I felt good about myself again. We got through that little crisis, and it was great. Yeah. So I think once he felt like, oh, they really do appreciate me, they really do love me, they value me, yeah. I think then he's like, okay. You and, know, you know, Paul can, once had some interview, because I, I have so many interviews, and I remember Paul, uh, the Beatles, saying things. And he said, you know how it is with people. You don't always say, oh, you know, I think you're the greatest all the time. I take it for granted and things like that, and that kind of thing. That he didn't, Exactly. It wasn't expressed enough. Hey, look, Wingo came back, at least with the song Octopus's Garden, tucked in his his pocket because he mm. went out to, to Sardinia and he, he wanted to write in Octopus's Garden while he was on hiatus. Right. So That's right. He got a song yeah. out of it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Some, <laughs> some good came out of it anyway. It seems like he lost confidence in himself and then gained it back and it took a little bit of talking to the other guys to get him back in, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that was it, that he just didn't, as I said, he didn't feel valued, and he uh, just felt that the other guys were just off doing their own thing, and, and so, uh, yeah, and I, I, but uh, once they assured him that that wasn't the case, that they still needed him, then all was right again. Right. Uh, since George Martin went on vacation, how much of the White Album did he actually work on? Well, as I said, it's it's a little bit of <laughs> a question um, because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, according to um, uh, Ken's book, uh, Ken Womack's book, that there were times when he uh, really didn't have much to do with the work that he was often sitting just sort of sitting in the con control room with, as, as uh, Ken put it, a large stack of newspapers and a giant bar of chocolate <laughs> and, and would only, and would, would emerge when he was called upon, you know, by, uh, by the Beatles. Um, yeah. I mean, I think he, he really uh, kind of like what we were talking about earlier that he just, um, the, the roles were being reversed here. I think, you know, the, the right. Beatles were now saying we're not just the students anymore. Exactly. Um, you know, now I think, and also I think, um, uh, I think it was Jeff Emmerich told this story in his book about how uh, there was, the, he witnessed this dust up where uh, I think it was Obel Dee Obel Da. I think they were recording that and Paul was singing it and George Martin was suggesting oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, that George or Martin said, you know, Paul, you might want to try this way or something, <laughs> and and you know, Paul was pretty much, f you, why don't you come down and sing this <laughs> then, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, stuff like that that yeah, I'm yeah. sure not that long ago they would have never said to George. It's going to happen eventually, and that uh, we're not going to get into that other subject here. <laughs> but the idea <laughs> about the revisionism, you know, oh, everything right. was so hunky dory with the Beatles. They weren't really. Tense. They weren't really going to split up, you know. But uh, <laughs> you know, um, and then even you know George Martin. The thing with George Martin he even extended, obviously, into the Let It Be or Get Back sessions, and to the point where I, re I distinctly remember interview an interview with George Martin from saying, you know, and I really thought that was the after Let It Be. To, you know, he said, and I really thought that was the end, and I didn't want to work with them anymore. Yeah. He said that. Uh, I can still hear it. And he says, and then you know, of course, he was asked. He wanted to, he practically begged him to come back to Abbey Road. He said, "Will you, I'll produce it if you let me produce it." You know, right. he said, "Will you do it the way you used to? You make an album the way we used to do it." You know, mm -hmm. and he said, "Well, does John feel the same way, Paul?" Yes, John feels the same. You know, then you know, he, then he said Abbey Road was a very happy album, and it was yes, kind it of was. you know, so yeah, you know, so he really yeah, even extending from the, the White Album into the Get Back sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you for that answer. Um, what do you two make of the poster on the White Album, the pictures and the cover? I can well, make a hat. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I got that from, I think, Airplane. There you go. Yeah, oh yeah, that's right. I know what you're talking about. 
Well, uh, I, I just happened to, a, a few years ago, I did a presentation about the White Album and, and sort of, you know, 10 interesting things about the White Album. And I actually did talk about uh, the, the artist um, who was Richard Hamilton, who, was, uh, who designed both the album cover and uh, the poster inside. And he's really was considered the founder of pop art. I mean, when you say, when you think of pop art now, you tend to think of Andy Warhol. Well, Richard Hamilton predated him. Um, he right. was really the, the founder of it. Um, and, you know, he was really, uh, the, the album cover was meant as sort of interpreting, you know, the, the, the audience interprets it the way they want to. Um, it was a, sort of an invitation for the audience to become part of the artwork, kind of like what Yoko was doing um, at that time, like when she did that cut piece where the audience would come up and cut off pieces of her clothing and, and that kind of thing. I mean, it was that kind of art as a communal thing, you know, of, right. of everybody getting involved. And so that's what um, that the album cover was about, because not only was it about the Beatles getting back to basics, it was the exact opposite of the ornate Sgt. Pepper and Magical yeah. Mystery Tour covers. That, that's the most obvious, and yeah, it was. Mm. But it was also, you know, this nod to this, to this, you know, art scene that was going on. And apparently Paul met um, uh, Hamilton and asked him if he would do the uh, album cover. And originally it was supposed to have a coffee cup stain on the on the cover mm. um and uh, they nixed that so he uh and and it wasn't supposed to have the beatles and ray's lettering either um right. but uh the beatles overruled him on that and then the collage that was what he was known for were these uh hamilton were these collages um mm -hmm. and some of them were i mean if you look at them uh, look them up online they, they were pretty funny i mean kind of amusing uh, and, and meant to be, and sort of questioning, you know, why can't a toaster be considered art as much as the Mona Lisa? You know, things like that. Um, right. And yeah, so it really, it's it's representative. Of, it's not only saying that the Beatles are entering this new phase and this stripped down phase, but it's also kind of a snapshot of, you know, the art scene of 1968. You know, it's really, right. uh, he's a really interesting guy. I, I, until I, you know, researched this, I had never heard of him. I mean, as I said, when I thought of pop art, I thought of Andy Warhol. But, right. nope, he's before <laughs> that. I, I, I like I'll, that the, uh, it's such a bizarre piece of, of work, uh, you know, different array of shots and things. Because, you know, my favorite, I, I'll say my favorite period, I love all the periods of the Beatles, but my favorite is probably the early Beatles. I like the earlier stuff. But I like that when they got to this, you know, they had some rough edges some weird stuff some of the creative stuff but and i don't ever want that part of the beatles to get scrubbed clean you know right. uh which is kind of like what i believe is starting to happen a little for a while now you know but that's again another topic so i love right. a poster like that that's kind of bizarre and it's got some questionable images in there you know right. uh and so on it's it's it, it, it actually by that time you know it just gives a little more edge makes them a little more Hey, what word can you use? Cool or something yeah. at edgy. the time, you know? A little yeah. edgy, you know? We went through the yeah, 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 shaking your head, your hand, going woo stuff, Ooh. you right. know. And now we got now we're having a little bit more of this uh, moving on, getting a little more mature, a little, a little weird, maybe a little drugged out. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you said that right. Uh, dr <laughs> drugs played a big part in it. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm going to give you my opinion about the cover anyway, and then I'm going to hand it off to the bulldog and let him uh, bark at you for a little while. Hey, bulldog. <laughs> but <laughs> my my opinion about the, the cover of the White Album, when you look at it, you look at it like, okay, what is this? And it's the same way with the music inside on the album is you don't know what to expect so to me that's what it looked like it was pick up this white album and you don't know what to expect and then you put this uh the record on the record player and you play it and with the mixing of the songs you never knew what you were going to get 
want with the next song. So uh, to me, that's what I looked at when I seen the white album, the cover anyway. It's yeah. a, a, a plain canvas, maybe. With, yeah. With, right. Exactly. <laughs> well, All yeah. I can't splattered. imagine a dollhouse, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to hand it off to the bulldog. All yours. Just when you guys were talking about Ringo leaving and, um, you know, the story's been told, you said. But I was just thinking, you know, a little further in a line of thought we had before. George Martin flies away. Jeff Emmerich quits. Ringo leaves. Like, do you think maybe it was like in Let It Be, you saw some fights like, you know, you had send the, said the one kit between Paul and George. I'll play what you want me to play. It was kind of overblown. But, I mean, what happened, I'm just wondering what happened to Ringo, like if there's, you know, some things were kept quiet, I think, but I just wonder. Um, you know, it was a little deeper than that for him just to walk out of the sessions. Like, do you think he was, like when he left, I, I wonder if he was coming back. I don't know. I mean, you know, this is, this is, as you know, we've talked about before, getting into the, to the realm of speedology. Yes, exactly, <laughs> and into speculation and you know all that stuff. But I mean, yeah. it's not that far fetched when we look at what's going on. I think it's it's mm -hmm. less likely that George Martin just said, "I'm going to leave for Spain," right. and we'll leave with Jeff Emery quits from oh, the beat, sure. and oh, then yeah. Ringo's like, you know, sayonara, you know. Yeah, I mean, who knows? You know, maybe maybe there was. I I mean, I think it was Ringo feeling undervalued, but maybe there was an incident where you know. Oh. They said, you know, John said, I don't like the way you played that or, you know, or something. And there was a well, flare. Forget, I mean, who I, knows? You know, and people who know me know that the last thing I am, I will be as a Yoko basher. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Yoko was there. The bed was in the studio. That and, was my uh, next question. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll, all right. So I'll we'll lead into that. You know, uh, and Paul always, Paul called it the 1980 musician a magazine uh, interview. He's called it the tension album. Mm -hmm. right now, the right. tension album. Yeah. Now, I mean, if you we didn't bring that up yet, but with everybody fleeing, and I mean, she came in at that point. How tense do you think she made it? Like these guys had some serious rules. Like, you know, women don't come in this. You know, the girlfriends, the wives don't come in the studio really for the most part. Yeah. Then there was. A story I found hysterical where, you know, there was a biscuit on a plate with George. Uh, yeah, and, like, Yoko <laughs> ate a biscuit and he called her a blank because this is a G-rated show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But if it was, see, this is why I defend Yoko. If it was anybody else, it wouldn't be a big deal, you know. But it's mm -hmm. Yoko, so everybody has, has the thing. Mm -hmm. no, it might have been a lot more innocent than it sounds, but it makes, a, it makes for a good, juicy it's story. It's funny. <laughs> for a funny story. Yeah. But I mean, what do you think just... the other three are thinking? Like, you guys know this stuff, and you don't have to bash her. I'm just looking, like, for what happened. Like, they're in the studio, and, you know, business as usual, we're playing. And she wasn't with them in India at all, that I recall, right? She didn't go. It was oh. Cynthia. Oh. So all of a sudden, at some point between India and the White Album, Yoko is as close to him that she's going to come into recording sessions, which is quite a quantum leap from what was going on. I don't know what was going on behind the scenes. Right. But you're in the studio, and something must have happened. And then, you know, was she, do you think, part of that? Like, I'm just trying to picture the atmosphere when they're recording. And maybe when they're alone, they're saying, well, she came today. Will she be here tomorrow? And then this happened and that happened. And then after that car accident, they did bring a bed in the studio. It was, I mean, it, it's pretty, like, you know, the Ruddles did a great job of it. You know, like, when they spoofed Yoko and stuff like that. Yeah, but. Yeah. But what do you think that, like, I would be picturing, like, oh, my God, what's happening here? It's been the four of us, and this person we don't even know, you've just, you know, changed wives, sort of, or she's moving towards being your wife, and, and here she is in every recording session on every song, and she seems quite strong-willed. Like, you know, her opinion, I don't think, is something she hits the brakes on very often. Yeah, well, as much as I uh, I defend Yoko a lot, and I defend John a lot with that, um, I try to be fair, and even though John's my personal favorite Beatle and all that, uh, but I could still be critical, you know, I, I if it was up to me, I don't think it was his place to do that. I don't think, I think Yoko, even though he wanted to be together every second, uh, I, I don't think you should impose on the others, you know, uh, that that's just not where 
his head was at. I think he was wrong for doing that, John, even though uh, I, I, I always liked John. Uh, and Yoko shouldn't have, even if he wanted her there. I mean, Yoko, you know, you think Yoko would say, no, no, that's not my place. But no, yeah, it's, it's that, almost yeah. like they were almost doing it to push it, to, to throw it in their face. Faces. And hence, that's what I'm wondering. I don't know which book I read it in. I was looking through Jeff Emmerich's book again before the show. It might be in there, but I couldn't find it. Sherlock Holmes called me. But there was one in one of the big books, and it was by someone who was in the mix. It wasn't like, you know, by someone who just researched it. And they were saying Paul went up to John and he said about Revolution 9, like, are you basically trying to ruin the album? In a sense, like you're trying to make us like not beatily, but beyond that, like they had a confrontation. And then John's reaction led Paul to say basically yes. And he laughed. And I was just wondering if when he brought Yoko in, part of it was like, it's kind of like he wanted to get out, like he got out of his marriage. And here comes a crowbar to just break this open. Now, I'm reading into it, but that's basically what we do most of the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, but the thing is, I think we could go around in circles as the song. Ah, like the song. Yeah. And so, say, yes, there. we can speculate for hours, you know. Speculate. Not, I don't, speculation's fun. I mean, nothing mm -hmm. wrong with it. But um, I wonder if we'd ever arrive at any any definite thing. Well, um, if that story was true, I think we did arrive at something. Like, if he confronted him and said, why are you putting this whole thing Basically, you've alienated George because he can't get his songs on. And you put, you know, that song. If he, if John wrote, like, his best song ever and George couldn't get a song on, I'd say, you know, okay, he, he outdid him. What can you do? You have to wait to get the other song on. But he's replacing it with that, you know, piece of work, which is quite different. You know, like George had said, avant-garde a clue. And then, you know, you're bringing Yoko in. It's almost like John is trying to... You know, break the foundation when I look at yeah, it. I, I think so. I, I think you have a point there, and I think a lot of people think think that. Um, yeah, um, but it's also interesting. I, I think to to try to uh, to have something really wild like that on there. Um, as I say, I'm trying to be objective about it. I don't. I wouldn't play Revolution Nine for kicks or enjoyment. Just unless I wanted to tell a friend or something. Wait till you hear this thing. You know? Like the Letterman couldn't have pulled that off. <laughs> yeah, well, but that's part of the part the of the you know, family wouldn't have had like I think I love you backed with revolution. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, really, you know, but oh, bloody, oh, bloody, you know, there's that scene uh, in, uh, you know, what's that movie, uh, the TV movie, John and Yoko, a love story. Oh yeah. And they have that, you know, it's all it's stuff just written, you know, a lot of it just poetic, uh, artistic license, excuse me. Yes. And it's like uh, there's a scene in there where. It's, you know, Paul's trying to say it's we just have a problem with it in context of the other songs on the album. And the John character goes, One of the songs. Oh but you know, like making fun of it. You know, it's like and I I could get some of that a little bit too. Like let's get you know. He wants to be more avant garde experimental. He wants less of that kind of like granny pap on there. You know, you I think understand. Paul was really that granny pap. I just think they're beautiful like people knock Michelle. Like, okay. Somebody wants to knock it, even if you're a musician or something, top it. You know, like Paul puts out yesterday, which they kind of made fun of. I mean, top it. It's like those are wonderful songs. It's just not the other guy's style. Right. You know, they're like always, not... always topping each other. So, you know, I think that's the greatness of them. Yeah. And then John would come yeah. back with something else. Like, I don't think Paul wrote granny music. I think it was just I doing think... nice songs. Not only, it's not only granny music, but I think some of it's fair to call that. But again, you know, I just, I just, you know, object. In your opinion, but on, in your Beatle opinion, as a Beatle commentator, which songs would you think were granny music and Paul sang? Like, if you want to pull some out, like which that he, songs that he wrote or just set or oh, sang that he stole from the Letterman? Yes. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, well, until there was you, for example, is uh, yeah. is, is one uh, mm -hmm. that he didn't write. Um, but okay. Um, well, like I happen to love your mother should know, but she doesn't mean I don't love this stuff. But I even put Obla the Obla on there. I said it belongs to be on there and it's fun, you know, and all that. Um, but objectively, even though I love somebody or, the, you know, the music. And by the way, for the record, I always have to say this because Paul fans get so irate. I think that even though John's my favorite, Paul is the most talented songwriter. He's the best musician. I think he has the, the, the bat in the best sense of melody. 
and, uh, yes, he's a mel- he's a genius. Yeah, um, but sure. with four, this is a whole other topic. It's just like <laughs> that's with another four, show. You know, Joe can Porchon. do compilations on the next show. How yeah. about with, and this will be White Album and me bringing up Granny music with Lauren and, and then John's sure. hard edge deep I stuff. I mean, John's been going on forty years. For he hasn't had the chance deep. to keep up new stuff like Paul's done for forty years, and um, and I I can praise stuff he's Paul's done in his solo career. Since the last 40, 40 years, all, all day. But, uh, yeah, you asked me the songs, though. But, yeah, uh, Your Mother Should Know, which I absolutely love. When I'm 64, which I love. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I have no problem with anything. you got to understand, I'm not, you know, I'm not, how should I say? I'm not knocking it. I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now it's all this. You know it's music, it would have been all right. <laughs> but it, you know, but I know what he mean. You know, I know there's a lot of people who feel that way. But it doesn't mean I don't. I don't love it. I just said I love my love. For God's sake, there's people who can't stand the whoa, whoa, whoa's in there. I think it's, it, you know, I love it. You know, um, fun, I dig it. <laughs> I'm a fan. Well, and, 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 and certainly the you know another thing too is with with these you know the the granny songs. I mean you know this is part of of Paul's background. I mean you know his father oh, yes, he, was yeah. uh, you know was in the music hall and and uh, cool. you know so he grew up on some of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so so I think you know when he writes about some of these, particularly when I'm 64, but there were other cases too that that you know these are very personal. Uh, statements yeah. for him, and they're they're odes, you know, they're they're tributes to his, you know, kind of his past, his his background, and much as you know, John liked to call it granny music, and all, you know, he and and uh, the others um, heard plenty of music hall stuff too, like George Formby, you know, he was uh, part of that tradition. So I have no idea were, who that is. Tell me oh, who that is. George George Formby was this uh, is a, a just briefly a fascinating character who um, played the ukulele and uh, he started out on the stage. Did he have a nickname he, like ukulele Ike or something? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I I'm trying to remember if he had a particular different uke. I'm sorry. Continue. I apologize. Oh no no that's okay no and uh, and he became uh, so he started off on the stage and then he was one of the few that really transitioned to um, radio and then film and he was huge in in Britain not really in America he never did anything you know, here, but he was kind of the lovable loser character and he was an incredible ukulele player and he did these kind of corny, uh, you know, sometimes romantic songs, sometimes really like one of them was banned by the BBC called um, Cleaning Windows and it was him singing a song about the things he sees in buildings when he's cleaning windows, (laughs) wink, wink. Um, (laughs) uh, But, I mean, to this day, he's a beloved figure and uh, John George, in fact, in, during some of the Let It Be sessions, they even play some George Forby stuff. Uh, Leaning on a Lamppost, I think, was another one of his uh, signature songs. So did the much Herman's as Hermits do that one later? Uh, I yes, think yes. they did. Yes. I like the Herman's Hermits. Herman's Herman's. Like they got knocked for when everybody was supposed to be <laughs> I cool. love Herman's Hermits. And I yep. do too. And yeah, I do too. Good was pop band. To drugged out and cool. I missed the last comment Kit said because I was talking over you. I apologize. Say oh, that no. kind of But it was just, I, I love the Herman's Hermits. When everybody was dropping acid, they might not have seemed cool, but then their brains are fried and everybody was screwed up and everybody's in rehab. There's nothing wrong with the Herman's Hermits. I'm all against the Vietnam War. But I, I love John, too. I like Paul a little more. I'm a Paul fan, but that doesn't mean I don't like John. But it's just, I don't get, I don't think anything he said was that deep. It's like Bob Dylan, none of them are. Like, it's different music. It's be- It's musically better. The songs, if you look at the lyrics, sometimes you might pass them over. But when they sing them, it's like magic. So when everybody says, like, John was a harder edge, agreed. Like, Paul's not going to be going, mother, you had me. He could it's never like- write a song. Paul could never write a song. As a matter of fact, he wouldn't have the guts to write a song like that. Now we're getting yeah. there. I don't know about guts. <laughs> you know, we're getting there that's... now, uh, okay? The thing, the thing, the problem is, is to be that it's a whole other show if you ever want to do it. <laughs> I mean, really, you know. I it... do. You've called me out on this one. <laughs> we will have another show. When, and I... when John, <laughs> when John was first murdered, you know, let's use the word. Um, you know, yeah, he uh, unfairly was deified. It became like this untouchable god, and that was ridiculous. You know, to the he wouldn't wanted that. He wouldn't wanted that. But then. Uh, 
some um, I, I hate to say Paul fans because I'm a Paul fan. That darn it. <laughs> well, I like both of them. It's not like I don't like John. No, no. I just but don't... there's still people still think he's in John Shadow. People still think that he he he's had 40 years to re re uh, uh, reinvent himself, tour all over. Young people today, you know, new generations, they don't even probably even know there was a John Lennon. It's all Paul. Go you know go to the yeah. tour, and that's fine. I don't. Hold it against Paul for God. Thank God he's alive and still doing it. Um, it's wonderful. I see him every time he's touring. But my, I guess I'm getting away from. You know what I'm trying to say. My point is, I don't think this like, oh, it's all about John. Or John. That's gone, gone. You know, now it's more the other way. The pendulum has swung. That it's all. Most people are Paul fans these days, especially young mm -hmm. new people that right. don't haven't grown up with John. You know, and I, and I feel that's sad that 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 that's happened. And it, he needs so much defending where now, whereas. It used to be the other way around to a ridiculous extent. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're both I, yeah. doing okay. I mean, I mean, they're both doing all right. I mean, it's yeah. not bad when people have your posters on their wall and we're still talking about them every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. But but I do great. remember reading. But I I do remember. You know, there was a there was a time shortly after uh, John uh, was murdered that you know there were um, interviews that Paul gave, and you know Paul was really on the defensive because for a while it was first of all it was John was the hard rocker, he was the avant garde one. Paul was the ballads guy and the pop guy and he was also Paul was portrayed as he was the one that really broke up the the group and you know and that kind of stuff and well, you um, gotta make up his mind Paul excuse me with that because he, like he wanted John to be quiet about it then he went and went and turned on and broke up the group after he right. told everybody John to be quiet about it but mm -hmm. so did John break it up or didn't he break it up yeah I mean it's it's, it it's such a Yep, uh -huh. that's it's such a complicated, and that's another show. But yeah. um, <laughs> yes, you'll both have to come back. Man. <laughs> this For is sure. a real fun show. This is fun. Yeah, really. But um, but I think um, uh, what was my? Oh yes. So <laughs> what was sorry, my point? Yes, sir. So yep. Uh, but uh, but anyway. So yeah, there was a time when. Uh, when Paul was, I think, given bad press, and and as you said. You know, John was kind of, you know, sainted uh, in in a way, and and as you said, John wouldn't want that. I mean, I think he was well, the like last he would person. Want a statue, like they say, they, some guy that I knew wanted to put a statue in Central Park made from melted down guns, and they said, oh, no matter what side of the gun debate you're on, they were going to take guns that killed policemen and melt them down and make a statue. Yeah. And like I, I got to talk to somebody trying to promote that, you know, and and. And I got to mention to them, you know, this is a project in the works. And one of the things they were saying, he really wouldn't like a statue. So it's exactly yeah. what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. exactly. And you're on target with that. Yeah. But look, can we do the compilations on the next show? Sure. So can yeah. this line. It's fun. I like going through this John versus Paul kind of thing. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, believe it or not, believe it or not, I don't. Even though I've made, you know, I have a video channel. I made video, uh, have video on it. But uh, yeah, uh, it's just the way it is. You know, uh, these these. I just hate that that exists. But look at it on the bright side. That's one of the ingredients that made the Beatles that we know so great with John and Paul. They, they would, they would definitely they loved each other. But that they were so. You had that contrast, right. and that's a. Mm -hmm. That's so great. That's that's the reason that sometimes you get a kind of division where even though we love all four or we love John and Paul, you know, sometimes there's, well, you know what, my favorite, my favorite, this one a little bit more or that one. You know. Yeah, sure. But Paul is also a rocker. I mean, you go to see yeah. the shows you're talking about. He's a rocker, looks, too. <laughs> I mean, he's got nothing to apologize for when he's up there playing the, you know, the rock and roll numbers. I mean, yes. he, he, he rocks the house. Yes, he does. Yep. Oh, absolutely. But I still and believe there's a thing where there could be a, a general – people get a general reputation for a reason or, you know, and there's a reason why Paul is considered more of a, I don't know, a music person and John was more of a lyric person. Even though, of course, the, you know, John could write great music, Paul could write great lyrics, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And John was more of the harder edge and Paul was more of the soft. There's a reason why that uh, persists and why – because – over the big picture, that's I, th I think, in my opinion, anyway, that's what came more to the, the fore. You know, uh, Paul is generally softer, I would say, than John. Well, I mean, the, the hard edge thing, it's like, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, but like you go to an event with Yoko in a bag, you're having a bed in, you're saying give peace a chance. It's like 
you know, it's a good thing that stand up against for peace. Peace is a great thing. But it's like Paul was never going to come out with Linda in a bag. No. It's a little joke. We're allowed to, we're allowed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was never going to bring her out like in a bag and she was going to, you know, you know, like when they were in Amsterdam or something and they said, we have waited for you all these years and here you are in bags. You know, like, yeah. like it wasn't all stick. But I mean, in the end, really, they both were great. Yeah, in their own ways, absolutely, yeah. and and uh, you know, and as you were you were uh, saying, Joe, that you know that yes, the at you know on the surface, at, at the, immediately you say yeah that Paul was on you know softer John, you know harder, but of course when you really dig into the catalogs, like, you know, like we all do uh, as, as Beatleologists and, mm-hmm. and as and solo fans and all, you know, of course you see it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. That in are. fact, yeah, that in fact, John wrote some, you know, very tender love songs. Of course. And, uh, and Paul and, wrote, you know, Paul Paul wrote rocked, some rockers. Rocked his butt off. Mm-hmm. Of exactly. He's one of the greatest rockers ever. Well, kid, exactly. you're a doctor, right? You're a licensed doctor, so I ask you this question, like Doctor yeah, Phil. I didn't know about. I didn't know about that. <laughs> Tell me the cough I had last week. I got week. my diploma she, upstairs. Wow. Like, oh, she comes on with a little black bag, and she helped me out of a cough and some allergy problems I was having. But if you look at John's solo career, what was softer than that? He became for a while Doctor Phil, at least in his image. I mean, it was like. He, you know, he became a house husband. He was running around with his wife all the time, which is nice. I'm not knocking that. And then, I'm not knocking it. I always love that quote. And then, like, uh, you know, he was singing songs like, Oh, My Love. And, you know, it yeah. was all gooey. A lot of them were gooey love songs, too. Right. It's like, I mean, where were the hard rockers then, you know? I guess damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, know, you, can't, you, you know, no matter what he does, it's not, you know, he's going to get knocked, I guess. Yeah, because, I mean, of you course, Plastic it. Ono Band, I mean, that was as, pre, as raw as it gets. Uh, yeah. Not just in terms of just straight-ahead rockers, but but just, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Mother, I mean, that's, what, I think, one of the most raw, kind of confrontational kind of songs you'll, you'll hear. Um, but, uh, and New York City. Uh, sometime in New York City. I mean, those had that had some uh, some rockers on there, um, but yeah, I mean, certainly by Double Fantasy, um, you know, he did change to a bit more of a um, adult contemporary. It. Yeah, I was going to say I hate to say adult contemporary, but, yeah. but I don't know how else to put it. That's what it is? Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, but uh, and and he got knocked for that, you know, at the time uh, before he passed. Mm. And, you know, then, then that stopped. But before then, yeah, I mean, he was, you know, knocked for that. Um, so, uh, was, yeah, so definitely in his solo career, he wasn't just, you know, rocking out all the time. What would he have done from from 1980 to now? Yeah, who know. Man, never know. Big question. Yeah. But we had Gary Van Syok on, and I've interviewed him a couple of times from The Elephants, and I he, he said clearly, like, they'd be rehearsing in the Greenwich Village and John would get a call from Paul when they were supposed to hate each other in the media. And they would, and he said clearly, John would get on the phone with him. Now, the time length I'm trying to remember, it was at least an hour, it sounded like. Yeah, one to he two said hours. for hours. Hours. And then, like, he would, he said they were talking like brothers. And then in the press, it would say, like, horrible quotes. And then they were talking to each other about family and everything else on the phone at the rehearsals. Very uh, yeah, like fetal geniuses. Do, do you remember, uh, there was a, right around that time, I, I I don't know if it was on the Mike Douglas show or the Dick Cavett show, um, right around that time, where they were talking about, somebody in the audience asked, what did you think of Paul's new album? And he says, the Wings one, you know, the Wildlife one, and he says, he's getting better, you know, whatever. And then he says, uh, talking about how do you sleep or whatnot also, and he says, hey, if I can't have a fight with my best friend, you know, who can I have a fight? Like a everybody's best friends uh, have a times where they kind of quarrel and sure. i like that we'll put that postcard in where it was like wrestling a pig <laughs> yeah, well, look, like i say the show's not i'm assuming the show's not long enough because i'll go if you want to go i mean the thing is <laughs> paul, <laughs> knows, paul knew john better than anybody else he should know if you want to take a little sneaky that's what i mean he's gonna make yeah. a few like veiled digs at john john just goes boom yeah you want, you want to make a few little digs like this i'll, I'll just come right out I'm doing. He should have known that about John. They were friends. Well, for- sure. Do you know the song I mean, you two. 
when he thought it was about like he was writing about Linda was yeah, he was uh, wrong about I, I guess you never knew dear boy what you had yeah, found he was wrong about that one yeah yeah but that one about Linda's ex husband yes it was and then John was sitting in Greenwich Village paranoid saying he's writing about me <laughs> well let me ask let me ask you this and I get this in real life too it's like if you're not going to tell me anything and I got to figure it out like a magician all the time how am I supposed to know you know uh, you know the too many people he was right about. Paul only re fairly recently admitted that. Paul's well, on the back. That's not that vicious, right though, out. is it? I mean, I think John took a, was, was, had a little more of a razor blade to him in that stuff. Well, yeah, I think he, I, good for him. I, I think that Paul yeah. should know that, you know. That's my opinion on it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, he, you know, he knows John a long time. He's not going mm -hmm. to kind of appreciate that. And I like it. I think it's, yeah, and, I think it's interesting yeah. we're talking about it. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> And I got, <laughs> and I got Kate, to say, you're, I, out of, I, you're out of focus, Kit. Yeah, oh. what happened? Oh, that's weird. You you're going in and out of now and then, but I don't know how that happens. But yeah. we can put her cover when she's out of focus, and she'll sell more. She'll sell even more books than she does. <laughs> <laughs> am I am I okay now? Uh, you're still a little blurry, but more oh, books. So weird. Yeah, we'll you were in. you were fine up until a minute ago. Okay, that is really strange. I don't know why that because yeah, it doesn't show that on my screen. That's really strange. Yeah, I'm gonna hand right, over to go. Martin after one more question. After we get Kit on fuzzy, unless you guys would like to plug your products, we could put book covers in and products. I, I don't have any products. Podcast, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's no problem. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna write my, my the Bob Wills my experience with Bob Wilson on the uh, Tomorrow Never Knows show book. I'm gonna put out. <laughs> <you> <laughs> Good Lord, help everyone! But it it's like when they played the Ringo album. I think the magic was still there. We bring this up. I love that album. When they got together, like people go, well, you know, if they played together, who knows what would happen? I know what would happen. In '73, they still had it. Now, mm -hmm. Toothpaste Snore was terrible, but they were wasted in Los Angeles, right? <laughs> well, that could have been the name of the album, Wasted in Los Angeles. But if, <laughs> they, if, if they had gotten together at the Venus and Mars time, what do you think would have happened? I just, you, you know, you're putting your imagination caps on. But, I mean, they get together, John comes down to New Orleans. Venus and Mars was a fairly strong album. If you add John to it, I'm sure Ringo would have shown up. He was always a trooper. He didn't bust chops. And, I don't know, maybe they could have offered George, like, you know, the crumpet that Yoko ate and he would have come out. But what do you think that might have been like had they got back together then, even if they didn't play live and they just did a studio album? Well, who knows for sure. But for me personally, um, I'm not one of the, unfortunately, I, you know, I'm kind of like Ken Michaels in that regard. I know we're similar with that. It's like I'm, I'm fine with, I grew up after really the breakup more or less. So I'm all right with it. And also I think I'm so glad they went out on top and they didn't risk it because eventually – you're gonna have a you're gonna have a real bomb, or at least yeah. something not, that's not the beat as great as the Beatles. Well, it would have been I'm better than Let It Be. I'm sorry, Let It Be. It would have been better than Let It Be. <laughs> what? What? The album Let It Be? Well, yeah, I think it could have been recorded better. I think Paul wrote oh, some well, great songs. It's got it's... three number ones on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no kidding. Sure. Do any other albums have three number one? I don't, I don't know. But no, I'm, I mean, I understand be... your point. When I'm saying Paul like wrote those songs, I think the rest of the album was kind of not their strongest. Um, well, this is good because it's, you know, it's a little bit, it's, it's a little caustic. It's good. You can say as you think. I like it. The show spices up when we. Oh, that's what I do. That's, wait till I start doing that more on, on Talk More Talk. You haven't seen anything yet. Uh, uh, <laughs> feel more comfortable and come at me, come right at my throat and say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm very, I'm very passionate. Don't, don't, just understand it's my passion, that's all. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to tell the whole thing. I'm going to give her views on it, too. But I just feel like uh, I wouldn't want them to have a dirty well, work well, album. they didn't like have a terrible stuff. album. They came back together and it didn't stink. Like, wouldn't it have been fun? It wouldn't it have been Look, the Beatles split in 69, and since then they've been doing fine. And if that question doesn't cease, ain't nobody going to get no peace. Remember when Paul, as Paul used to quote... That George Foreman? <laughs> Paul, <laughs> he was a Paul, man, I thought no, he sold grills. <laughs> Paul used to do that in, in, in a Muhammad Ali style. He used to do yes, that. I did not know. I yeah, didn't okay, know that, that either. I, yeah, actually... I got him doing it. I got it oh, do you? Oh, wow. I, yeah, no, I didn't know that, that either. Yeah, he used to do <laughs> that as a joke. Uh, and he used to imitate Muhammad Ali. 
but uh, that was that's around you know seventy the early seventy seventy four something like that. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm anyway. Do I? Th- but do I think it would have been good? Could have been nice. Could have been good. Could have been a well, Ringo bad. worked, in, in the, he invited him to come to Venus and the Venus and Mars oh, sessions, right? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, he was think Paul obviously was thinking about it. Yep, yep, supposedly, yeah. Doctor Kid, maybe you'll play along a little more. <laughs> <laughs> what? What do you? Is this where we bash Yoko for like making a, making jo- trolling John into not doing it? <laughs> Is that the next oh, song? Okay. I don't know if I buy that either, but uh, no, you know. no. never, 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 never gonna let John go. Yeah. Keep the reunion, get him back here. Yeah. <laughs> oh man! Oh man! If the album was good. If the album was good, and him and Yoko could have had bliss two years later, she could have broken them up a second time. What? No. <laughs> she never broke them up. Oh, All four Beatles no. said they did. All four Beatles have said that it wasn't it wasn't Yoko. not exclusively Yoko, but yeah. it was a, right. It was an ingredient, just like anything else. Just exactly. Like, uh, there was a married, it was, children, as I George said, a get, perfect storm. Yeah, I didn't George, say only Yoko broke them up. Yeah. But on <laughs> that on that Thank note, you, kid, Yoko. What you, Thank you. Oh, so Yoko will come on your show, and we've already established if she ever gets wind of these things, she's never coming on as a guest on our show. So if she <laughs> doesn't talk or talk, I'll just listen in the chat room. But kid. <laughs> What do you think if the album was good and there was a little magic like the Ringo album? What do you think? Just well, I, I mean, it would have been great. I mean, you know, I, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm I'm just so hesitant about it because, um, you know, would it have been, you know, I, I would just hate it if it had been where, you know, it, it was a letdown. I mean, you know, because they really, I think the Beatles went Listen, out on top. Jeffrey Robbins, if it was good. <laughs> Is that his name, the positive thinking guy, Jeffrey Ryan? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I know who you're talking about. I don't think that's it, but I know I, – I uh, can't think of his name, but I know who you're talking about. Um, but, you know, I, I just think, though, that they – they probably did it right, you know, that they went out on top. Um, I mean, it's hard to top. I mean, I know Let It Be was technically the last album released, but but Abbey Road was the last one they recorded. So I'm, I'm so using everything that. Everything the Stones have done since then is irrelevant. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think maybe eh, like 1980 <laughs> to me may have been like the last really I, I went solid you know, Stone's album with, um, oh, like, uh, Emotional Rescue and, and, yeah, uh, I'll go with Tattoo You in 81, which I think was, yes, some leftover, start me up. leftovers, I think, from some girls or something. Yeah. So their, their albums stink, but let so these albums stink, we've established that. Now I got the Stones fans burning the castle. Yeah, right. But they did live shows. Perhaps the Beatles would have been great in the studio, and they might not want, because of George, to have gone on the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've always wondered about that. You know, as much as I love, you know, George and Ringo, I, I mean, I, I've always, I, I had a hard time picturing them doing like big concert shows in, you know, going on into the seventies and eighty eighties. If John was here, you know, if they were together, I don't, I don't know why I can't somehow picture Ringo on the drums. Now, he's got two drummers, more than one drummer now. You know, I don't know. I, I love Ringo and his drumming. You know what I'm saying? Studio. Uh, and everything, but I just well, I wonder. And George, uh, I'm sometimes a little harsh on it on his guitar playing at times. That's I praise of Paul some more. I sometimes say I, I like Paul's gu- guitar playing better at times. Uh, Lee think he's a better lead guitar player at times. But so, uh, you know what messages you're going to get on Facebook, and we base <laughs> the other one I'm going to get. So keep oh, I've been, I, oh, I've been there. Believe me, I can. You got to see you, Bob. It gets. I get pulled from. I, I always do this with my arms. I, I get pulled this way. You're nothing but a Beatles hater or a Paul hater. <laughs> this way, you're nothing but a sicko fan apologizing for Paul and the Beatles all the time. <laughs> it's like you know you can't. I, it's like you can't. You know, I you just try to win. be in the middle. And depending on at the least situation. Kit doesn't set you up. Warren comes on and goes. The guest will bring up Yoko. We'll bring up, bring you know, like you had said. Oh no, we're going to go into Yoko bashing now. I'm, I'm getting a feel we'll say, I like yeah. Yoko. I don't blame her for anything. Bob <laughs> hates her. So oh. thank you. For it. And like my inbox fills up with all these Yoko people. Hey, I turn John, over to Lauren. Lauren, <laughs> it's all yours. Well, first of all, I, to put my two cents in the conversation, um, I think. 
after the Beatles broke up, each one of them were writing good songs. And it would have took a long time for for them to put out a bad album. Um, I, I say they have at least another four to five great albums they could have made. And um, I don't think John and Paul were the problem with them getting back together. My opinion was George. I think George would have been the hard sell um, to get them back together. Ringo um, said no, but not to interrupt you, but Ringo kept saying no too all the time right. on shows uh, like Phil Donahue in mm-hmm. in seventy eight, and he was always saying no in the seventies too. Right. I just I I think Ringo would have gave in sooner or later, but George, um, I mm-hmm. don't I I don't see George giving in. Mm-hmm. I think George was set and happy to be on his own. And he was able to put out his own music without uh, John and Paul's approval. Right. Um, you know, he had his own albums, his own songs. And uh, I think he would have been the heart soul on that. But anyway, um, I'd like to know where the listeners can find you two on the Internet talk uh tell us about your books talk more talk podcasts and everything else great you guys do well well we both um are well we're half of uh of talk more talk uh we uh, co-host along with uh ken michaels and tom hanyati we are on every other monday on uh we are live on facebook uh, first, and then uh, the episode goes up usually the next day or the day after on our YouTube channel and on virtually any podcasting platform you can think of. Um, and uh, we definitely would love you to tune in and share your thoughts. That's a big part of our show. We want to hear what you think. Uh, and uh, and if you have suggestions for uh, topics that uh, that you uh, would like us to cover we are always uh we always consider uh, uh suggestions from people we've had some great suggestions in fact so uh so please feel free to do that uh as far as i go uh you can uh, follow me on facebook um at uh, my my uh, professional page which is kiddo tools keynotes you can follow me on twitter uh at kiddo tool all one word um and uh you can uh those two places are probably the best for uh finding out you know my latest articles that are up and latest uh, appearances like on this show and uh, and much more so that's um, that's it oh and then my books uh, songs for singing guide to tour so the Beatles lesser known tracks as well as Michael Jackson FAQ all that's left to know about the king of pop you can find those on Amazon nice. great books too thank you <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah. And how about you, me, Mr. Mayo? Yes, uh, I don't have any books yet. Uh, if I, you know, <laughs> maybe yeah, one day. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I'm Joe Mayo, and I have a YouTube channel called Mean Mr. Mayo. Sound familiar? Mustard Mayo. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I try not to be mean, but, you know, one, once in a while, maybe. But uh, <laughs> not really. But um, basically, I do Beatles videos, solo Beatle, Beatles videos. Uh, there's different topics I could come up with to discuss on my videos. If you want to subscribe over there, you could watch some stuff. And it's not just Beatles uh, talking and videos about them or solo Beatles. It's also collecting. I get into showing memorabilia. I collect a lot of records and stuff. People are interested in vinyl and stuff like that. Like a lot of rarities. I go on hunts trying to find this stuff. And I sometimes branch to things not even related to what we're talking about, like rant videos. Some people appreciate that, you know, things in in life that annoy the heck out of you, you know. I make rant videos too, and some people can commiserate, and they they like that, and I try to do some comedy. It's a little bit of everything, and uh, it's it's been a pleasure, by the way, being here, and I thank you both, uh, Warren and Bob, for, you know, letting me be here and come on. Thank you, Ida Ball, and then you guys I had a good time. <laughs> oh, I always enjoy time. being on with you guys. You'll come oh. back. I'd like to do a show. We talked about compilations, but does this sound cool? Anthology leading into Flaming Pie. Because I know your book had some of the songs from Flaming Pie in there, Kit. Sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I love Flaming Pie. 
And you know, it's Flaming not- Pie, if I may say, it's, you know, it's coming out as an archives edition in July. So maybe what, it'll oh. be kind of hot then. You know, yeah. I like it. Well, let's idea. do that. Good idea. But be- then before that, we could do the compilation show because we got a lot of time in between. Yes. Yes. Sure. Sounds good to me. Hey, can I sneak in one more question since we bagged a lot of stuff with the compilations for this time? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Bangladesh. George Harrison comes to Madison Square Garden. He invited all four Beatles. Here we go. Had they arrived. And don't give me you don't know and you're not going to speculate. Just flip it. (laughs) Had all four of them shown up, do they at least play on the stage at the same time together? Oh, well, I'm, I thought you were going to go somewhere else with this about who was <laughs> Take oh, another way to only going to be here if, you know, whatever. You, but if all four, I, you know, I always find with the, with the, what do you call it? When you try to like think what, what if or something that we tend, to, maybe you'll agree. I don't know. To only be able to go by what we know of now, like, uh, like sometimes you talk about John, what would he have been doing? What would he thought of this? And you say, well, John, you can only go by how he was thinking in 1980. That's the last we know. Mm-hmm. So based on that, same thing with the Beatles at that time. Seemed to me in '71 that they wouldn't want to be all on stage at the same time, all four together. Because if you did that, everybody would, in their minds, would be clamoring for a Beatles reunion. Say, oh, it's the Beatles reunion. Mm-hmm. In their minds, you know, but the cause was Bangladesh, starving people. Well, I know that. I yes, I know that. The George, I know you know it, but George is on board now. How many more albums would they have sold? You got the four of them playing something live. I don't think it was ever about how much the money or about they even had a charity. lot of offers for the yeah, charity. The charity well, yeah. They had charities before many times. The boat people in 1979 uh, was quoted. I have the newspaper still, you know, the New York Post. The Beatles are back, reuniting for the boat people. You know, 1979. <laughs> you know, oh, so wow. they, did, they didn't do it. For, I mean, I thought they wouldn't do it for any cause. It seemed. But well, George did invite them. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, and um, yeah, I oh, forget why. Ringo. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Ringo, of course. Uh, but uh, but yeah, did, and I forget why John. We did go there. We are going there. I see. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> right. Because <laughs> John said Yoko wanted to come, and he said no. And I heard. Oh he yeah, that's that. right. And at yeah. that particular time, you know, I hate to say, even though even though I I I went on record as saying, you know, I think it was wrong of. John and Yoko Room pose themselves together in the studio with the Beatles. But at that time, I kind of on John's side. It's like, look, we're together right now. We're we're an act. We're a couple. Right. We, this is what we do. It's us both or nothing. I don't mind him saying that at that time. Yeah. In that situation. Despite yeah. what all the Beatles fans, like myself, <laughs> wanted to see, you know. But it yeah. sounded like John wanted to go, and he wanted to do it uh-huh. with them. Because I had heard he walked out in a fight with her because she said, you're not going without me. I'm belaboring the point for like you know intrigue. <laughs> well, it's just you know I I don't I, you know it's hard for me to say because to me it's all about if there's a, any opportunity. And I'm not saying you're doing this necessarily, Bob, but I know I'm used to this from like talking to other people over the decades. Any opportunity to bash Yoko, it's like yeah, Yoko, don't do this, John. Don't do that, John. <laughs> it's always her, you know. So I don't know. I, I'm gonna call it Yoko derangement syndrome. <laughs> what, I was, what I was more trying to ask this time was, had they all been in the place, I think they would have snuck a song in for the sake of an album and, and the sales of the charity. If they all, if all four made it, and George was the one asking them, and he was usually the strongest one opposed to it, I think they might have played a song together on that album just to boost, you know, for just to boost sales. I wonder if George had that in mind, or he wouldn't have invited all four of them. I mean, it could be. I mean, obviously, you know, he would uh, he would think that would certainly. I mean, to, again, to put it coldly, uh, it would sell some some more records. That's for sure. Um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's one of those things where we're we're never going to know. Obviously. Well, I'll tell you what I I, I have thought, which is branching off. Okay, we're back bit. to the attorney for Miss Ono. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> this has nothing. This has nothing. This is, well, this is the uh, That's all right. I, uh, executioner I for Yoko. You. To the executioner for Yoko. <laughs> what I will, what I, what I will say is, no, this has nothing to do with Yoko. I've always believed that uh, had John lived, I think the closest I think would have been Live Aid. I have a, I don't know why. I have a feeling they might have done it for Live Aid. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I could Wait, see so. that. 
Definitely makes sense. I could picture it. I could yeah. picture that. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, I so are you guys going to sing with us? All been, right. Oh, sure, sure. I'm inviting the four of us to have a sing-along. Oh, All boy. right. <laughs> well, wait a minute. <laughs> All right, kid. You can't outdo us, kid. I can't sing. Come on, man. I can't sing. I can't. Oh, don't it's, worry about it, because I can't sing either. <laughs> it's not for song. It's for the fun and spontaneity and the good vibe of closing on a positive note. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. All so right. You guys are going to sing the middle together in a duet? All right. Sure. We can do that. <laughs> we can try it. As right. the fifth Beatle Lawrence Welk used to say, a one and a two. And in the end, the, the love of you, you take is equal to the love you make. <laughs> 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 All right, we did it. I want to thank you guys. Thank you guys very much for that coming was fun. on the show. Thank you guys. Thank you.